There's more to the open source world than just your typical Linux distros, so why not try something a little different and try FreeBSD? I'm Cool Mike, and I'm going to show you how FreeBSD works as one of the main OSs that I use on a daily basis. This video is going to run through a quick installation of FreeBSD 12.1 release, and we're going to install a basic KDE Plasma desktop environment. Future videos will go over additional customization, some common issues, and other software that I use as part of my workflow. To start, you need to get the image from freebsd.org and make a bootable installation disk. After you've done this, you can boot from that disk and the FreeBSD installer will start automatically. From here, you can enter a shell, try a live session of FreeBSD, or start the installation. We're just going to do a basic install today and mostly follow along with the prompts. The installation process is very straightforward. Even though it may not look very modern, your first decision is to choose a key map. In this case, I'm going to use the default. Then you'll need to create a host name. You can put anything you want here. I can easily change it later in the installation or down the road. Next, we can pick which additional components we want installed. The debugging sets have extra debugging symbols enabled. I haven't used this in the past and usually don't install them. I would recommend keeping the 32-bit compatibility layer unless you know you won't need it. The ports tree is an additional set of build scripts used to build and install third-party software like Firefox and Xorg using custom flags. If you're familiar with Gentoo, this is similar to and was actually the inspiration for Portage. I'm skipping ports for now because I generally don't need it and compiling takes forever on this laptop. If you do need ports later on, it's easy to get started by using something like Port Snap, which I could get into in a future video. Source is for the FreeBSD kernel and user land source tree. Like ports, I've never needed this, but it's easy to install after the fact. The last entry is for the test suite, which you shouldn't need for normal use. After we've picked our installation sets, we need to create a file system. We can do this manually in the shell or use one of the automatic options for UFS or ZFS. There's pros and cons to UFS and ZFS that we can talk about in a separate video, but one of FreeBSD's selling points has been the first class ZFS support. I also like that ZFS can use a fully encrypted file system. It's probably not necessary for most people and may actually provide a minimal benefit, but it's easy to do and it sounds cool, so why not try it? So we need to select our disk and what kind of mirroring or RAID we want. I don't have anything particularly important on my laptop that I'm worried about backing up and it's a smaller SSD, so I just go with no redundancy. This is quick and it gives me the most storage. If you're used to Linux, you'll notice that FreeBSD is a different naming system for disks. Typically for most normal users, internal hard drives and SSDs will be ADA and flash drives will be DA. Then we can go to disk encryption and just turn it on. Going down the list, you need to determine if you should use UEFI or BIOS to boot. There's also a selection for troublesome Lenovo laptops, although on my end, I've used the GPT UEFI option and just make sure in my BIOS settings that I'm set to boot from UEFI. We can change the amount of swap space we have. Everyone will tell you something different for how much swap is needed. Normally, I just match my RAM. Here, since it's in VirtualBox, I'm going to leave swap unchanged. The only change I'm going to make is to have my swap encrypted. The last file system config that we need to do is to pick a password that we know we won't forget. Once the system is installed, we pick a root password and set up networking. If files are needed during the installation that aren't available locally, the networking step may come up earlier. The installer lets us configure IPv4 and IPv6 with or without DHCP. On my normal laptop, Wi-Fi, and in VirtualBox, I had trouble with IPv6, and I just use IPv4 for now. You can see the IPv6 fields are blank. I'll eventually look into what actually is causing this problem, but for now it's okay. If Wi-Fi is being used, FreeBSD uses WPA supplicant and will automatically scan for any available networks. Next is the time zone setup. 
This is fairly straightforward and should work without any issues. We then select what we want to start at boot. Normally I leave SSHD selected, but I have no use for it in VirtualBox and decided to disable it for now. We're going to add more after we install some packages, but for now we want mouse D because we need this to use the mouse in some desktop environments and NTP date and NTP D to sync the time at boot and keep it synced during use. Power D would be useful, but I'm going to use a third party version called Power D++ that some people say gives you better results. There's lots of security focused options available. I only ever enable to clear temp since I'm the only one that uses this computer. Finally, we can add our user. The installer will lead us through the process of picking a name, adding the groups, and picking a password. For now, the only groups we need to add our user to are wheel and video. If you're new to the BSDs, you'll notice we can't select bash for our shell. That can be installed later just like you would for something like ZSH. I usually use TCSH since it has tab completion and it's already included in the base system. We then make sure our settings are correct and can add more users if needed. At this point, we can make changes or download the handbook to have an offline version. Since we're done and everything seems correct, we can just exit the installer and reboot the computer. Now that we're in our new system, the first thing I want to do is update the system with security patches and some possible bug fixes. This is done with the FreeBSD update command. Fetch is used to pull the updates and install is used to apply them. To save some time, we can run the two commands together. FreeBSD update is also used to upgrade between major and minor releases. This process also updates the kernel. FreeBSD keeps the old kernel version and it's usually a good idea to make sure the new one will boot before removing the old version. There usually aren't any problems with release. And since I've been using this kernel version on my laptop, I'm just going to remove the old version now. The old kernel has a .old suffix and is removed just like you'd remove any other directory. Packages are installed on FreeBSD using the package or PKG tool. On a fresh install, this needs to be bootstrapped by running the package command. After package is installed, we can update the repos using package update. By default, FreeBSD uses quarterly releases for its repos. Package search is used to find packages in the repos. Here we're searching for XOR just as an example. We want to use package install to install our basic desktop and some other tools. Do as is a lightweight alternative to sudo. DRMKmod provides some updated graphics drivers. SDDM is a display manager that works well with the Plasma desktop. There's several meta packages available for KDE. Plasma 5 Plasma desktop is the most basic and provides a very minimal set of desktop components. KDE 5 is the largest and it installs everything KDE has to offer including video editing software, an IDE, and a bunch of games. Plasma 5 Plasma is a middle ground that I found to have basically everything I need without including too much extra stuff. Not included in this meta package are things like a file manager, terminal emulator, and a GUI sound mixer, which is why I'm installing Dolphin, Console, and KMix. FreeBSD comes with a terminal volume application called Mixer, but KMix adds some nice GUI features. Wi-Fi Manager gives us a nice front end for switching networks rather than having to edit WPA supplicant config files by hand. PowerD++ can help manage battery life a little bit better on laptops. I'm installing Firefox for a browser. XF86 input synaptics for touchpad support. And VirtualBox OSC editions uh, without this package, FreeBSD doesn't always use the right drivers when inside VirtualBox. If you don't want to use Plasma, you'll need to install things like Xorg and Xinit manually, but for what I'm doing right now, they'll get pulled in as dependencies.
There's a few more things I want to set up before we're finished. The first is in the bootloader.conf file. This file loads kernel modules during boot. Loading the queues module is necessary for us to use a webcam. Loading the synaptic support lets us use two finger scrolling and things like Firefox. The touchpad will work without this, but extra features like two finger scrolling and tap to click won't work. Starting services in FreeBSD can be done in the rc.conf file. I want to load the i915 driver that we installed with DRMK mod. Kernel modules included in the base install are all in boot kernel. Any that we add manually are stored in boot modules. Specifying the i91 driver this way will load our version instead of the default included driver that has the same name. There's two ways to enable services. The first is to directly edit rc.conf like we're doing here with PowerD++. The second way is to use the service command. Use something like service webcamd enable. If you want to start the service without a reboot, we would then use the command service webcamd start. Webcamd works with the queues module to let us use a webcam. You can stop and disable services the same way by replacing enable and start with disable and stop. Enabling the services this way saves a little bit of typing because we can use our command history. The last few things we're going to enable are dbus and sddm. The last part of adding webcam support is to add our user to the webcamd group by using pwgroupmod. We couldn't add this group during the install because the webcamd group didn't exist at that point. Now using the id command, we can see that our user was added to the webcamd group. The very last thing to take care of is to make a config file for do as. For a basic setup, we just need to use permit wheel. This allows the wheel group to run as root when the correct password is provided. It's similar to using vsudo if you've installed sudo. Now if we reboot, all our changes should take effect and sddm should start right away. The boot failed error that keeps showing up is an error with my virtual box and it shouldn't happen with a real install. My laptop was pretty stretched during this video, so everything inside VirtualBox is a little slow and laggy, but works well enough to show what's included in our basic install. It's mainly things we installed explicitly because we used a somewhat bare meta package for KDE. If you want everything KDE has to offer, install the KDE5 meta package. It doesn't show up here, but on my laptop and desktop, suspend and resume also work pretty well. There's definitely a lot more to go through and show off, which I'll put in other videos. If anyone has any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know and I'll see if I can help or I could see what to improve on. So thanks for watching and if there's something you want to see in the future, just let me know.